and um, i thank i thank all of you for making the time out to join this uh, vertigo grand rounds uh, session so today we have dr pratik who will be dr pratik will be presenting uh, the case as usual we are going to have a case presentation followed by the the consultant who is going to be presenting the case he is going to ask present the case and then ask some questions after which i will be giving some context setting or background information giving slides then after which all the questions are going to be taken one by one and our panelist will have a go at trying to attempting to answer them as always here we try to discuss without the fear of being judged okay it's it's a free thought it's thinking as we go whatever because that is how that that is how we all grow so today dr pratik has chosen a patient of uh, a recurrent i mean fluctuant sensory neural hearing loss and uh, without vertigo and that is not because we have run out of cases of vertigo but that is actually because what happens in the cochlea this kind of fluctuant thing can show insights into our vertigo patient you can can throw insights into the recurrent vertigos that happen okay so thank you all for joining again so today what all we have dr pratik as i said we have as panelist dr amit keshav professor, professor in neurotology at sanjay gandhi post graduate institute he is a man with more than 15 book chapters and 50 public publications to his uh, credit okay and uh, he has he has received various fellowships including the london temporal bone course fellowship at the guys and st thomas hospital london uicc ice rittt fellowship in anterior skull base at faculty of medicine university of malaya malaysia american academy fellowship at housier institute los angeles usa and fsh fhno travel fellowship at tata memorial center mumbai then we have dr avinash bijlani who is going to be joining in a few more minutes he is a neurotologist and ent surgeon practicing in delhi he is the director of madhav medical center and uh, for ent and vertigo and he is a senior visiting consultant with the dhli super speciality hospital he has long experience in treating vertigo patients and is well versed in all the maneuvers of uh, for vertigo okay his uh, his was one of the first uh, few centers to be equipped uh, with the vng system and other uh, modalities of uh, diagnosis of vertigo okay he has been a continuous faculty in all the balance cons in all the nes cons for a long time now and he is given he has been the past president of ima karol bug branch then we also have okay the 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 consultant who is going to be presenting the case is dr pratik porwal he is a vertigo specialist he has worked with me in cyclops uh, medtech for more than 3 uh, years he was also at uh, trustwell hospital he has a special interests in vertigo and uh, balance disorders he has a special expertise in video ni stegography technique and uh, he teaches postgraduate students preparing for uh, dnp exams through his dnp mentors uh, channel he has in, huge numbers of publication the mo, uh, one publication on vng features of anterior canal bppv is oft quoted multiple times and it is okay bringing in a lot of multiple readings have happened okay and he does almost entire gamut of ent surgeries then we have dr kshitij malik okay dr kshitij malik has an undergraduate medical degree from manipal college of medical sciences okay in 2000 okay he took a post graduate degree from the university college london okay in audio vestibular medicine it is the united kingdom's foremost specialty that involves diagnosis and management of disorders of disorders of hearing and vertigo and then he was a clinical researcher at the great ormond street hospital london and researched on vestibular status in children pre and post cochlear implant surgery between 2006 and 2008 once back in india he started delhi's first vestibular diagnostic and rehabilitation center at defense colony in 2009 okay for many years dr malik's clinic was delhi ncr's only private center to carry out vng testing and soon followed it up with investigative modalities such as wemps ecog gvhit 
Vestibular rehabilitation with computerized feedback, biofeedback was started in 2012 in his clinic. Okay, this was followed up by a second setup for audio vestibular at Gurgaon. Today, Dr. Malik's prime clinics have established themselves as, as Delhi NCR's most reliable centers for vestibular diagnostic and rehabilitation. He has multiple affiliations to NES, AOI, Cochlear Implant Group of India and Indian Medical Association. He's been a faculty at several national uh, conferences, BalanceCon, NES, Indian Society of Otology, CG, AOI Delhi and AOI National Conference. We have also Dr. Pushkar Kasat. Okay. So his objective is, okay, he's already built a huge career in audio, uh, neurotology and audio, audio vestibular medicine. His main, his main concentration, the objective is he wants to specialize into preventing falls in the elderly, which is a big, big thing. Okay. And then he's already started a well-equipped uh, state-of-the-art vertigo clinic. The summary of his uh, uh, qualifications is uh, he, he has undergone tra multiple years of training in neurotology under Dr. Anirban Bishwas. He has an MNAMS, a DNB, and MS. Okay. He is currently a visiting consultant at Global Hospitals, uh, Parel, Mumbai, and Critical Care Hospital, private practitioner as a neurotologist in Airoli and Thane. He has received a higher training in neurotology, Indian Academy of Otorhinolaryngology, Head and Neck Surgery, India. That, that was in 2017. Okay. He has he's, uh, been award, attained outstanding performance okay, during the International Online Vestibular Diploma Comprehensive Examination. Okay. Then uh, successfully completed Migraine Experts Academy International uh, of International Headache Society. He has also been invited as a faculty to various national and international conferences. In neurotology, he is efficient. Uh, okay, he is known for efficient management of patients with vertigo, tinnitus, and balance disorders. And uh, he is he has special expertise in lot of vestibulometric uh, tests. Okay, he has uh, publications in index uh, uh, journals and he has several oral presentations. With that uh, introduction of all our panelists, it's I hand over the stage now to uh, Dr. Pratik Porwal to please uh, go ahead and make his presentation. Thank you so much, sir. So I will be uh, presenting a case of my very dear friend. He's suffering from a uh, few uh, disorders. So I will start with the chronological order. So this particular thing started in December, December of 2020. So in the right year, he had severe oral fullness, which was associated with tinnitus and hearing loss. This particular thing was not associated with vertigo. It lasted for around eight to 10 days and then everything returned to normal. The hearing also returned to normal, the tinnitus and oral fullness was completely gone. Then in January and between January and May 2021, he had the recur these recurrence attack, which is lasting for like after a gap of 20 to 30 days, each lasting for ar around 10 to 12 days. He had COVID in May, but that was during the asymptomatic periods and he has no attacks during those particular time. Then in August 21, he again had right ear tinnitus, which was very severe, oral fullness, which was again very severe, and a hearing loss. This was the time when there was uh, the lockdown was uh, partially lifted and he went to his nearby ENT doctor and the PTA was done. The first PTA done was completely normal because it was between the asymptomatic period. Now the attacks are actually lasting for eight to 10 days and they, every symptoms uh, actually return to normal on 12th day, like after one or two days. So this is the pure tone audiometry of 18th of August. We can see that the hearing is within normal limits. And on September 2021, we can see that there is a mild hearing loss in the low frequency zone. Then between September and November 2021, he again had very severe tinnitus, oral fullness, which was very severe that he used to hold his ear and he was not able to see any patient. And hearing loss was also very severe. These times, the attacks were lasting around 10 days and everything returned to normal as the attack subsided. 
he also noticed that the severity and duration of symptomatic days are increasing and after each attack like the first attack and the second attack and the fifth attack the duration and the severity of attacks are getting increased and the asymptomatic period or the gap between the two attacks is decreasing so in september he did his pt again and it was showing 40 db in low frequency uh, hertz then PT in November was showing normal hearing. So this is the pure tone audiometry in November and it was approximately normal. So first pattern we have seen is the hearing loss is coming back or it is uh, returning to the normal level. Then between November and December, he took beta histine diuretics, low side diet, diet without any relief. He went to Delhi and then he did WEMP, ECOG, MRI brain, pure audiometry, all were completely normal. Between January and February, he continued the same treatment and the frequency of attacks are now increased. Like within a month, he used to have four to five attacks. <clears throat> Between April and May 22, he was, uh, he was, uh, he went to SGPGI and then the Markers for autoimmune disease were done, like ANCA, ANA, ESR, RA, viral markers, CBC, etc., and all were completely normal. There, he took three doses of intratepanic dexamethasone at 10 days interval, and he felt better for approximately 40 days. The attacks are now lasting for only one to two days, and the severity is also less. The then the uh, this is the MRI of the patient and MRI is completely normal. This is the PTA pure tone audiometry. This uh, initial PTA was done in March. We can see that there is a low, low frequency hearing loss at uh, 200 and 500, uh, 500 K hertz. And then we can see that during after the intratympanic DEXA, the hearing has improved in April. Then in May, the hearing is uh, very good in the low frequency zone. But in high frequency, we can see that there is, again, the hearing loss is present, which is SNHL. Then this is the report of WIMP. And uh, he was diagnosed as cochlear hydrops. And ECOG was also done, which was normal. In the last two months, with, uh, between July, June and July, uh, he was started on flunarazine, 10 milligram HS from 17 June. The attacks are now gone, but he is feeling that there is a constant tinnitus, humming like tinnitus, and he has apparent hearing loss with no oral fullness. There is no history of migraine, headache, photophobia, or phonophobia. He had increased blood pressure five years back, but it is now under control. So this is the history, and uh, we can hear it from uh, the subject also. So I'm playing the video. Starting was done with sudden onset of tinnitus, fullness, and hearing loss. It was last around 8 to 10 days during this period. I was taken to the system and steam inhalation. Uh, after this episode, I relieved and I feel completely normal. Uh, again, after one month of this episode, again, similar episode lasting around 8 to 10 days. Similarly, I was taken again the same thing and it was relieved. And I was feeling completely normal. After two to two the similar three episodes, I was consulted from ENT uh, doctor. They performed proton audiometry and it was uh, showing some degree of SNHL and conducting deafness. So they ignored it uh, and I, again given me some decongestant and they took a biopsy. But the symptoms again and again come and go. During this time, the duration of symptoms increased and asymptomatic is decreased. After six to seven months, I again went to some other doctor, and this time they performed uh, audiometry, and it was almost normal. The symptoms uh, lasting around 20 to 25 days, and it lasts the day I was went uh, to consult a doctor. Uh, the pure audiometry was is around normal. Then they say uh, it may be uh, otosclerosis, and they uh, given me some multivitamins and say to me that if symptoms first, uh, present again, then come to myself. After this, uh, 
Tufut again started after 20 days. This time I was consulted some other ENT doctor and they say the hearing loss, tinnitus, and oral wound, and it may be indicate linear disease. And they started the treatment on the line of linear disease. Again, I was not relieved by verdict. Losal died and Leslie left. So then I went to Delhi to consult for some other doctors. And at this time, I have performed, I have done my MRI that was normal, total audimentary was normal, EPUBG was normal. At this time, I am uh, 2020, I went to SCPJ to meet Dr. Amin Kesri. They said it, it uh, uh, is cochlear head off and they start given intratympanic spike thedosis and oral spike for two months. After intratympanic injection, symptoms relieved for one month and again uh, it developed. Tinder, hearing loss and oral fullness. Now I am on Sibelium, 10 mg since last one and a half month, and I am feeling mild in interest, mild hearing loss, but no oral fullness. Thank you. So this was the video, and uh, I would like to ask the panelist whether it is a meniere's disease or it is a atypical meniere's disease, why the hearing loss is coming back again, and why not it is a just a feature of vestibular migraine because in vestibular migraine the duration of attacks are usually longer but not in meniere's disease so these are my few questions and what should we do should we continue uh, treating the patient on uh, anti migraine therapy plus vertin or should we give any other therapy so dr shrinivas sir yeah, so I will uh, share my uh, uh, slide um, and then after that, we will take uh, uh, the panelists uh, uh, views on each of your question. I will, I will want you to come back, uh, Pratik, to ask one question after the other. Okay. Sure. Okay. I hope you are able to see the screen. Yes, sir. Okay. That's good. So welcome to yet another Vertigo Grand Rounds. Okay. So some recognized and reasonably accepted causes of fluctuant sensory neural hearing loss is as part of meniere's disease, where we consider it as cochlear uh, meniere's or atypical meniere's, what Scott Brown calls as atypical meniere's or purely cochlear meniere's, which is, which, which is only isolated to the cochlea. So that is one thing. And that is one thing that all the time we think of when this kind of a patient comes most of the time. There are some other causes of... Uh, uh, fluctuant hearing loss which are documented very well documented that is because of large vestibular aqueduct then there are some other explanations which are given which also have found some ex uh, for some acceptance that uh, this uh, recurrent uh, fluctuant sensory neural hearing loss okay recurrent i mean uh, when we go to scott brown uh, so textbook the two things are uh, there one is a sudden sensory neural hearing loss and another is fluctuant sensory neural hearing loss so when it comes to fluctuant uh, sensory neural hearing loss, viral reactivation, okay, having parallel to herpes lesion of the skin or mucosa, you see, when we get a herpes lesion on the lip or something, okay, when we are stressed out or something happens or the environment changes, a lesion appears, it is there for four or five days and then it disappears on its own. So like that, uh, and that keeps happening over the years, okay, it, it can happen multiple times. So if something like that kind of a viral reactivation is happening, maybe that also could be causing this. Then, of course, we have the autoimmune inner ear disease, which is which has been there for a long time, that kind of discussion. Uh, but then uh, they are known for rapid progression. And then uh, a new entity that has started becoming uh, uh, well uh, uh, described of late is auto-inflammatory inner ear conditions. In fact, if you go to YouTube channel by the House Ear Institute, House Neurotology Sessions, we get a couple of very well, very good lectures on auto-inflammatory inner ear conditions. But then what one thing we have not been applied much, okay, is channelopathies, okay, before the, as, as channelopathies as an explanation. When we look at episodic disorders elsewhere and channelopathies as an explanation for them, it is quite established that when it comes to an, the epilepsy being an episodic disorder, that there is a clear cut association of channelopathies being demonstrated. In migraine, lot of phenotypes, okay, channelopathies are getting 
demonstrated episodic attacks yes okay it is always all uh, considered as as a channelopathy and then periodic paralysis of patients okay where they they here also there are channelopathies so we have problems with channelopathies which actually present as episodic disorders okay these are gene mutations which lead to a particular small amount of change a little change in the potassium channels or calcium channels or even for that matter sodium channels okay so if in the brain okay in 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 the central nervous system a channelopathy will become a circuitopathy which means a channel because neurons are connected interconnected one to one another if there is a one channel not functional then that actually ends up becoming a problem in the entire circuit okay so it is like that so that channelopathy can become circuitopathy and predispose patients to this episodic event then there can also be situations like the condition where we saw in the periodic paralysis link channelopathy is actually cause a loss of function in a in a particular cell okay it can be motor cell is what is it. why not sensory cell okay why not one channelopathy can cause a loss of function in a sensory cell for a short duration of time why though the channel is problematic all the time okay that gene mutation is there but why people only develop episodic events okay maybe it is related to the epigenetic expression okay epigenetic influences where a gene expression changes okay like environmental influences can up or down regulate gene expression these genes may be encoding for channels so the number of channels that are present on a particular neuron may increase may decrease the number of receptors may increase or decrease even the ligands may increase decrease this kind of things can happen and lead to at that particular point of time maybe it is just after a season change maybe it is just after a certain stress maybe it is just after having eaten something after being exposed to certain smell and after few hours or something or a new drug whatever all of these things can okay cause epigenetic influences and further lead to up and down regulation of these things leading to episodic events now the question is why not consider this also is one more thing okay why not consider channel because the moment we start even opening our minds to this possibility that it that this is also a big possibility that in around this channel of this then what would happen is the number of drugs suddenly the kind of drugs and the reasoning behind behind how those drugs see not just the number of drugs not just the kind of drugs we use the reasoning we use why those drugs work how or have been working also starts changing take the example of minieres disease okay and see the see the number of patients okay who number of physicians who actually use acetazolamide and Uh, and with reasonable amount of success in 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 a subgroup of patients in a subgroup of patients there is reasonable amount of success even with acetazolamide so is it actually the diuretic action of acetazolamide or is it the acetazolamide action which also brings about improvement in episodic attacks yes in periodic paralysis okay okay Uh, that being a channelopathy recognized channelopathy is it similar to that that it is actually bringing about a benefit in minier's disease these are the kind of questions that come to my mind and that is what i wanted to present to this one is viral reactivation auto inflammatory inner ear diseases and of course channelopathy is being an explanation why again channelopathy is being an explanation becomes becomes important because again new drugs we can start thinking not just about this thing there are so many other drugs which which are being used for channelopathies okay some of the drugs are phenytoin uh, then carbamazepine okay in, in addition to uh, phenyt phenytoin is there uh, carbamazepine is there then of course we have been using acetazolamide for a long time and then there is another drug called sulthime so it it could be any one of these things so we don't know where this uh, the opportunities is uh, going to increase by keeping our eyes open to that so with that in mind i think when pratik uh, suggested this paper I, i was more than willing to accept uh, this for the presentation because of the opportunities it actually presents though this patient does not have any vertigo okay the opportunities it presents to actually go deep into this are going to be high so that is one so now with all this in mind uh, we'll ta start taking the question one after the other pratik again is it minious disease uh, doctor uh, doctor so actually i have seen this patient yeah you all of you other than pushkar every every other panelist has seen this patient that's why we, right. we call pushkar is also connected to this 
Okay, okay, okay. 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 So okay. I will tell you that how it is connected. The okay. world is a very small place. So okay. uh, what happened that when I see see the patient first, then with the history I knew that it's a cochlear high drops. And frankly, I have seen four five cases in my life, and they responded very well to the treatment we give for Meniere's disease, and sometimes intertimbanic steroids, right? And we saw that was the only treatment which was offered in house here institute. They used to inject every time. The only thing was that the episodes were very frequent. Uh, the cochlear high drops, uh, the frequency is very less as compared to what is episode. Then uh, after the recovery, we thought that it may be something that autoimmune idea. So we did the autoimmune workup. After the intratympanic therapy, he responded well. earlier just for the because first line is always the medical management for meniere which he did not respond much but after the intratympanic therapy he responded so it gave us an indirect idea okay we are dealing with a cochlear high drops but then again when the symptom arose uh, i was like uh, that we are missing something here uh, i was recently in mumbai in tmh i attended one of the lectures by puskar right so and then uh, incidentally i was reading a paper that when they said that if there is a hearing loss and if in steroids are not working you give low dose uh, sibelium right or whatever fluoralazine and it works it is it is beyond this uh, i mean you can go through the paper uh, it's very detailed paper available and then uh, dr puskar was taking a lecture and i was present there and he told me that uh, uh, this patient is having uh, if the patient might present like this and then with the background knowledge that when the venous do not respond some of it has either mixed component of venous and uh, migraine vestibular migraine or some are purely vestibular migraine which miss as venous disease and uh, there are many papers to say that if the patient does not respond to venous disease treatment you add anti migraine therapy and it works so with all this the autoimmune in ear disease was not ruled out because we have not done the heat shock protein 70 uh, which we will be starting doing very soon so if heat shock protein is present then it goes towards the meniere disease that's why i given him a long term low dose oral steroid also just to cover because there is no other diagnosis uh, for autoimmune inflammatory or you can say the inner ear autoimmune diseases so this was my thought process and after fluoralazine he is step he 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 has now better but we know that he has some residual hearing loss in high frequency which may be cause of his tinnitus and stress is one of the also important factor when you are thinking about it all the time uh, because this uh, i i i saw that uh, this uh, doctor is very much uh, hampered by the symptoms obviously this kind of symptom gives some stress so that is also so that is how i went about the diagnosis and uh, the questions remain that what is the diagnosis and what should be the optimal treatment but this was what my thought process and i am still learning because every patient is a learning opportunity so if i would think do something different maybe i would do a heat shock protein and then keep him on uh, sibelium for a little longer term and uh, maybe that it's a mix of cochlear high drops with some amount of uh, vestibular migraine that's what i feel because uh, ye- neurological deficit in migraines always come back to normal here there is some residual deficit in the hearing usually it happens uh, so that's that's also an important point when i was discussing with neurologists that they say that usually it come back to the normal the migraines things when it become normal so uh, i mean off to the expert panelist and uh, dr puskar is also here and dr chitesh has also seen this patient so one Process. thing uh, one thing which is uh, against vestibular migraine is in vestibular migraine patients the hearing loss should be bilateral like around 80% of times it should be bilateral but in this patient we can see that the hearing loss is mainly on the right side and left side is completely normal yeah pratik but uh, i think uh, dr puskar was quoting something and uh, now uh, maybe that when i see in the retrospect i have seen your lateral hearing loss also so maybe i mean it's like uh, it's, a, it's an open question yes 
would we call it a cochlear migraine Instead i think we will call we will call pushkar to take a uh, go at that pushkar okay and before pushkar okay i wanted to just ask dr amit so when you said improvement okay you said that there has been improvement after this so what was the kind of improvement when you when you meant improvement because this always has been a fluctuant condition so yeah. it would go so when you say improvement is it increase in the gap between episode or the episode duration came down what was the improvement uh, so actually i mean the um, uh, duration increase and that's typical how the menias or i mean this disorder when the du- duration of attacks decrease first and then stabilize so, so the duration decreased and also uh, uh, is that his uh, uh, hearing improved right so when he came to me uh, in my own uh, place or i could see good improvement of hearing right sometime patient tell that they have a improvement of hearing but when you do audiometry it may hardly 4 5 decibel there was significant 40 decibel hearing improvement after intratympanic and all that and uh, i mean uh, that's why i say that improvement the duration has, but he was not completely cured of it i thought that uh, he will be cured of after intratympanic dystonia if it is the cochlear hydrops the other thing is that we might have done lesser duration of injection but due to logistic reasons patient coming from outside we do it weekly but if it is done at 0 3 and 7 days something like that it will be more effective the intratympanic therapy oh yes sir so i'm so if 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 you had an option then you would want to do more frequent injections okay uh, yeah, where that the was the if, if, yeah. but i feel that is a cochlear high drops It can okay. be menias, atypical menias, along with atypical. some yeah. component of vestibular migraine. I mean, something is there definitely. Uh, Doctor Pushkar, uh, I mean, yes, your comments. Do- uh, yeah, Doctor Pushkar, um, specifically, can you comment on uh, uh, unilateral being b- being a, a manifestation of the migraine? Unilateral manifestation of migraine is very rare. You uh, sometimes it may happen. sense and like if- there is one more thing uh, what i would like to comment one way of finding out is uh, whether uh, the uh, patient is having cochlear hydrops or not one thing is uh, uh, we can do a mri of the inner ear uh, with uh, intratympanic uh, gadolinium so uh, we will come to know ki whether the endolymph is this uh, uh, hydrops that can be done that is one option and uh, mri of the inner ear will also rule out if there is any component of cochlear uh, aqueduct enlargement which is very rare or vestibular aqueduct enlargement which may be based on a normal mri brain so that is one thing that we can uh, rule out any structural abnormality which is causing this problem again and again and uh, then after that uh, once that is ruled out then we can think in terms of ki baba since uh, there is no unilateral cause any condition which is uh, pointing towards a unilateral cause uh, like hydrops or anything then like dr amit told uh, it could be a mixed disorder migraine with menia component of um, uh, sorry menia with component of migraine and uh, between uh, between intra tympanic gadolinium and iv gadolinium what is your preference uh, dr pushkar i have not tried both very much in my patients but uh, okay. for this specific uh, specific case i would say ki uh, intra tympanic gadolinium is better because it will concentrate okay. and uh, we will come to know whether there is any uh, uh, small thing or something is okay okay so so i mean uh, just coming to that we have done an mri mm-hmm. and we the couple of other issues also come up when they have unilateral issues like mm-hmm. uh, there may be some vascular loop okay mm-hmm. so uh, that also causes hearing loss but the improvement mm-hmm. to near normal 
is not seen mm. in large vestibular aqueduct we can very well uh, find in mri we are very so because we do lot of cochlear implants so we are yeah, yeah. very and uh, also uh, with every episode i think i think we lost uh, dr ramit's uh, voice voice yes i think we lost dr ramit's voice okay by the time he comes back so my question is one more thing dr so there, there is a re yeah dr ramit is back okay sir we lost you for some time we were not hearing sorry yeah uh, okay so we are in Looks like, like uh, Dr. Ramit. Uh, audible. No, sir. We are. You are not audible. Okay, no, that is audible. okay. Okay, right. Okay. No. Okay. By the time Dr. Ramit's voice gets uh, yeah. uh, okay, we, we, he becomes audible. We'll just uh, oh, take the no, other sir, question. I just want to ask uh, Dr. Okay. Avinash Bijlani since Dr. Ramit yeah. mentioned about vascular loops. Mm. And uh, Dr. Bijlani has worked quite a lot on vascular loops and uh, EA, so maybe he is yeah. a better person to comment about that. Yeah. So, so, uh, and for that, I want to ask one more thing: is uh, I will take in Dr. Avinash Bijlani, and then Dr. Bijlani can also comment. So, between intratympanic and uh, intravenous gadolinium, okay, between intratympanic and intravenous uh, uh, gadolinium, there is a temptation to use intravenous. if inversion recovery that 4 hours uh, later inversion recovery gadolinium is going to show the endolymphatic eye drops the temptation to use intravenous uh, gadolinium is that simultaneously you can do multiple other things in the sense you can use the same opportunity to do an angio you can use the same opportunity to do a veno you can use the same opportunity to probably screen for small vestibular schwannoma so much new opportunities will come up if you give intravenous only thing but if you only go intra tympanic then we are, we will only get an opportunity to look at the only the inner ear condition so because of that we have an opportunity we there is going to be uh, the there is going to be that uh, temptation to go for um, intra tympanic uh, i mean intra venous i i i'm i'm getting tempted in fact i got two of my latest patients with intra venous gadolinium with 4 hour uh four hours later inversion recovery uh, rather than uh, intra tympanic again intra tympanic means again we'll have to poke both ears these kind of things used to happen but then we really need to probably put all our uh, experiences together and decide which is actually better for endolymphatic eye drops i think that uh, we we will put we, in the days to come we will get to know uh, dr bijlani so what possibility that this kind of a presentation is actually precipitated at least precipitated by vascular loop uh well the possibility is always there but uh, in this particular patient i think dr amit keshi just mentioned that they have already got an mri done okay. and uh, i am not sure whether a cis sequence or a fiesta sequence was done and if it was done and there is no vascular loop so in this patient that's out of the question that answers the first part that was done sir not a cis sequence not done no, done 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 cis done. was done and uh, it was normal completely normal oh, great so for this patient this particular diagnosis is out as far as this particular patient is concerned but uh, in general yes why not because there are so many papers uh, where i've read that uh, isolated hearing loss and tinnitus minus the vertigo uh, you can definitely have it in vestibular paroxysmia with the loop so in fact uh, there is a uh, typical uh, type of uh, uh, tinnitus also reported uh, quite rare although typewriter tinnitus right and uh, hearing loss both have been reported so that is a possibility albeit uh, the fact that in this patient no because if the mri is done say sequence is done there's no point in thinking on those lines now since i have been given the opportunity to say something uh, i think uh, eva that is the enlarged vestibular aqueduct is already ruled out because first of all the progression is very rapid in eva and it presents more often in childhood right and moreover uh, it is by and large at least 80% of the patients it's bilateral so that particular because i was listening to dr srinivas uh, talking about uh, all the possible diagnoses the differential diagnosis 
so eva is out and autoimmune has been ruled out by the multiple tests also so i think it boils down to migraine versus meniere and since we know that they form a complex and both the diseases can be uh, co present and sometimes it can be very difficult to differentiate between the two now since the patient in his best interest he has responded so well to fluorazine i think uh, i would think in terms of a meniere mig uh, migraine complex dr kshitij what were your thoughts when this patient presented to you and how 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 did your thought process run sir i am an aberration here because i got a call from dr pratik that his classmate is coming and i welcomed okay. him and, and dr pratik had asked for two tests so i didn't even take the history i said he he's his friend so he's my friend so we just got it, got it done so i'm i'm probably the least informed clinician here despite having seen the patient because i didn't really take it as my patient i i took it as his patient i'm just sort of the conduit to get the test done so is a specific specific thing that you want to ask me about this <laughs> no no but okay considering that this patient is going to be your patient then like how how do you uh, like what what is your thought process at at this stage so at this stage if i've seen um, a lot of things having been tried and some of them have worked Mm-hmm. um again we would go in the direction of the therapeutic trial bit that whatever works is mm-hmm. is mm-hmm. indicative of what the primary concern is and, and in that therapeutic trial armamentarium what are the things you will think of no it's already been done so i i really don't need to visualize anything dr keshi has given him intradermic steroids he seems to feel that the work well uh, by the way here uh, the studies in house here institute uh, about intradermic steroids i think the concentration of dexamethasone is way more than the the concentration we use in india um, so that may also alter uh, some of the results and we can't really uh, i mean i'm i'm sure you got good results had we used even higher concentrates of dexamethasone i think they used 10 uh, Uh, I agree. I, I agree. The strength is quite good. The uh, the I mean uh, the timing they give in the round window dependent position is quite uh, a little uh, different than what we use in our daily OPD. And uh, there are also some reports that if you with we use methyl protein solen, it's it's even better. but the concentration because uh, if it is a buffered solution or something uh, it's it will be better i agree with you dr chit is not this can't because yes, because the maximum strength we have got is 80 mg per 2 oh. ml so when we give 0.5 ml that the max we can give in the middle layer it's around 20 mg and and some people have good aqua for in channels through round window or through the cochlea the oval window also but some do not have that so yes, a, a better concentration will really have no doubt about it so better concentration in the sense what exactly is the concentration that we use there i think it was 60 mg uh, 40 or 60 mg in 1 ml per ml well. okay oh, that, that's huge. that's you come i don't remember well because it has been almost 6 okay. years and i just just i remember that what is strength we have got because there is no preparation in the market and the volume is limited you put can put into uh, the put more volume the, the it goes the in q and then absolutely yeah, all the absolutely. you can exactly yes. you can put more than more than 0.3 or 0.4 and one more thing you are talking you, dr amit you mentioned something and thanks to, to dr shitish for bringing about this point of high concentration dexamethasone uh, you are also talking about a particular position of the ear that is round bit rinder dependent different from what we do here what is that position can you just elaborate on that sir actually what, uh, what happened when they uh, actually when they put inter tympanic they put phenol on the tympanic membrane that kind okay. of uh, give the anesthesia to that area mm. and become that mm-hmm. area become little whitish so they uh, uh, go through it and mm-hmm. uh, there is small long needle they put it and then mm-hmm. rotate the patient head mm-hmm. and then put the in the dependent position and they pay, they lie down the patient uh, uh, chair uh, the patient lie down they put up the light for 10 to 15 minute and tell patient to relax not to swallow too much 
So around 15 minute in the dependent position, head is in the little dependent position, lower than the that, and the chair uh, is uh, taken down. So the patient is mm -hmm. sitting, but his all torso is down. And then they mm -hmm. rotate in the other direction. If they're putting in the left side, mm -hmm. they rotate head on the other direction. And then uh, in this way. So they make the round window area dependent and then uh, mm -hmm. uh, put it there, patient for 10 to 15 minutes to rest. They put up the light and then the patient, uh, they tell them to rest for 15, 20 minutes. After that, he's made to get up and then because for menias also they do not have beta astin since long so uh, mm -hmm. for menias also they and they do not use gentamicin because of the litigation issues so they use mm -hmm. uh, dexamethasone as front line if it does not work they do indolapatic sac decompression and because the beta astin they sometimes source from canada and all that because in canada it is available now it's available in us i guess since last one two years ago uh, so 16 to till 2018 19 it was not available the beta esteen so they have only had diuretics and uh, um, intratympanic dax and endolympathic sac decompression i i think uh, i agree with uh, you in the sense i think we also should be using intratympanic uh, dexamethasone more frequently it is it is an underutilized uh, um, uh, medicine, maybe we should use more and then probably we should have an advocacy so that our uh, pharma uh, uh, like regulator allows the higher because I've had talks with some of the pharma manufacturers and they tell the problem is with the regulator giving permission for higher concentrations which they are not giving because it should not be utilized for something else or whatever reason. Maybe for a pure uh, intratympanic purpose, we, they should start thinking of making a higher concentration of uh, intratympanic uh, available. So we have also among our uh, uh, participants here, uh, Dr. Yona Woda. Okay, she is uh, from um, uh, Romania, and, and I heard um, she's a very good friend, and uh, I've had the opportunity of visiting uh, her place. It's one of the most well equipped across the globe. Vert Vertigo clinics, two clinics. She runs. She heads two Vertigo clinics. Okay, in two cities, 500 kilometers apart, everything that you ask for in Vertigo is there in their setup. Okay, they have around 20 people, five ENT surgeons and uh, remaining uh, people from uh, drawn from uh, physiotherapy. Okay, so they give a lot of care. She's there in the group here. Okay, if I would like to ask Madam, Dr. Dr. Yona, if she can unmute herself and... Uh, uh, hello, what sir. Concentration of, hello, ma'am. What concentration of uh, dexamethasone do you have in uh, Romania? We have. Uh, for, hello, sir. Uh, yes, I am sorry for my connection. Uh, it's totally unstable, but I hear you and I see you a little bit. Uh, in Romania, we have two type of uh, dexamethasone. Uh, we have four milligrams and eight milligrams. We use four milligrams of, mil, okay, uh, like of dexamethasone. Okay. Uh, yes. And um, you, we use um, the style uh, described already by the doctor um, who talked about uh, how to put the patient, how to put the uh, ear uh, in a position to be sure that you uh, have the dexamethasone on, on the round uh, window. At least we we'll, uh, uh, give this patient uh, near 40 minutes in this position to have a good absorption. Uh, we hope that we have it. For this um, uh, case, important it's uh, to uh, the time. Um, uh, in my head, it's, uh, it's only unilateral disease. It's fluctuating, should be something there. I had, uh, unfortunately, a patient with paraneoplasic uh, pathology. Uh, I had one with uh, uh, hearing loss, fluctuating hearing loss, unilateral, and also I had a um, VPPB or migraine-like uh, symptom uh, with vertigo. And finally, was uh, a metastatic uh, breast cancer. So um, um, I hope will be not uh, a 
neoplastic pathology in this case, but um, when I don't know the real etiology, I keep the patient uh, three, five, uh, or your hundred days. I like uh, on beta histine to see in pathology symptoms. After that, I change after hundred uh, days. I change with uh, flunarizin or uh, topiramat or doesn't matter something for migraine, and I see how it works. And after that, if it doesn't work, I will put it on low doses, maybe 0.5 milligram of methylprednisolone per kilogram, um, long time, 300 days, to see in which uh, um, treatment uh, the patient don't have symptoms. So maybe this also can help because um, um, we had a lot of patients with uh, bilateral uh, fluctuation uh, of hearing loss. Uh, one week in left side, one week in right side, and after that again, and was not an autoimmune disease. I have two or three Kogan syndrome that works only with uh, uh, bilat uh, with uh, cortisone, oral cortisone, not intratympanic dexamethasone. I try it a lot, but um, um, also with methotrexate. But I don't know if it worth to who, to try also um, methotrexate in unilateral pathology. But uh, for me, I will try only with one kind of treatment, like hydropic, uh, cochlear hydropic year, 300 uh, days and so on. This is my opinion when I'm not sure about the etiology. Thank you so okay. much. Thank we spoke you, a lot of, you. thank you so much. Thank you. That was a nice perspective. Just to summarize what uh, Dr. Yona Vodas told is that uh, uh, one is when there are unilateral, then um, her antennas are up looking for some cause. She's had her experience where there have been uh, paraneoplastic uh, uh, manifestations presenting that, even metastasis manifesting like that. And uh, uh, then she spoke about her uh, regimen of first trying beta histine, then trying anti migraine agent. And if that also fails, then trying a low dose uh, uh, steroid orally for a long time. So these are very nice uh, perspectives. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for... Uh, Thank you so time. much. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Dr. Bijlani? Yes, uh, Dr. Srinivas. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, any more comments? Not really. Yes, sir. Uh, this is one of the rarest of rare cases, in fact, I would say. Yes, sir and uh, needs a lot of introspection before we commit to a diagnosis. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, Dr. Amit Keshri has done a really wonderful job uh, by ultimately, because I think he's the last person the patient went to. And uh, having tried his intratympanic steroids, then discussed with Pushkar, he shifted to flunarizine. So I think uh, compliments to him. Yeah, the way when he, when he first told us in somehow Pushkar is related to this, I didn't, I couldn't figure out how is Pushkar related and then both of, he, he listened to his talk. The idea uh, is uh, the, the, possible. The, that was nice. the, the sequence of events and the thought process has been really wonderful. Thank you, yeah. sir. It's just that. No, no, uh, and, uh, it's and, a uh, and one thing is, all, 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 all neurotology people are now becoming one family. And yeah, uh, it is turning out that all of us are seeing that that difficult patient is being seen by all of us. Uh, when I saw the patient initially, he was at the very initial stages. I think uh, Dr. Pratik, right? Uh, I think uh, after you had seen the patient, you sent him uh, to uh, me. In between, he had been to a hospital, and uh, uh, I saw the audiogram from that hospital also. Yes. So things were pretty ambiguous at that point of time. And I think uh, now that uh, we are talking quite informally, I think we had a bit of uh, argument over this also. And let me admit, 
I said, no, 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 no. I can't even uh, label it at this stage and all those kind of things. But see, things have evolved. And I'm so happy to be a part of this group today uh, that uh, things are much more clear. Pratik. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I think you. I, I remember correctly. Correct, sir. Correct, sir. Yeah. So, uh, so one final comments from all of us, Dr. Kshitij. So one final question, sir. Oh, you you will ask one more question and it will go to 10.30. Okay, please. No, sir. Last question. Yeah. So, right ear is compromised right now. Yeah. Yeah. What about the left ear? What could be the future of left ear? What could Absolutely. be? Absolutely. That, that, that's a real, real concern. Like, what will happen? What if the person tells, okay, I'm okay with losing one year or I'm okay with it, what is going to happen to the other year and what can... I have had this situation with a, with, with a very small uh, girl who was around seven or eight years old. She used to keep losing her hearing. It would be lost for four or five days and then it comes back on her own. It keeps happening. And then as things progress, the extent to which it comes back starts becoming lesser and lesser. Okay, but then they are resigned to the fact that they will lose one year, but then what will happen if something happens to the other year? So is there some something that each one of us can think of? What do, what do we tell to the patient or what is it that we can do so that that kind of a situation? Do we have a solution? Okay. Uh, sir, can all of uh, one, one? Yeah. Most important thing is the counseling, sir. And then maybe that we can do a regular audiogram. The other yes, thing sir. I tell patient that you can listen everything. If they, even if the hearing is gone, you will listen. So the stress you have to take a take away from the patient and then counsel him properly that you may but that's not the uh, because in lateral hearing loss we see daily uh, in the day to day life from sudden causes or from other causes uh, in fluctuating hearing loss what works like the girl you said is uh, i have wonderful result with hyperbaric oxygen therapy so okay. hyperbaric oxygen therapy works really very well for recent onset, because it is a very good free radical scavenging, and uh, I have read multiple papers about it. So we are giving and we are getting. Uh, I mean, not so where do you send the patient, sir? Uh, good results. Uh, so we take around twenty dives, and uh, it's available in plastic surgery department in one of the medical colleges. So we send our patient there, okay. and they have been. I mean. The deterioration is stopped. That is for sure. Improvement also happens. Suppose I have given a patient of sudden SNHL intratympanic therapy and he has not responded or responded partially. Then I tell them to get hyperbaric oxygen. If they are from the Lucknow, they are able to take it. When they are coming from outside, then it's a difficult possibility. It's in the government hospital, it's quite cheap. But now hyperbaric oxygen is available in every metro for various purposes. And uh, this is very, very good. I will tell all the audience to read about it in SNHL and it, it, it is very good because there was a study that when they do less oxygen in medical students, uh, the, the, um, the DPOE become distorted and then, then when they re-oxygenated them, the DPOE came back to the normal. So uh, there no, are studies. Right. <coughs> so we can uh, think about these lines of management for SNHL. And uh, the other year, we just need to maybe that counseling and a strict follow-up every six monthly, if nothing happens for three, four visits, then it's less likely to get affected. So six months is the time that you will take that, okay. Now you, you, you want a window period of six months. Okay. That's again, hyperbaric accident. Uh, I think I... oxygen is one thing all of us will start exploring who has in each of our cities. And thank you for that uh, information also, uh, Dr. Amit. Um, okay. Uh, final thoughts from each one of us. Can I start with Dr. Can I... Yeah. yeah. So I'll give my final thoughts. And before that, I would like to share my screen, G, if that's possible. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, that, that is possible. Uh, yeah, you are, you are one of the co-host gee um, I, when i said it's possible i meant can i do it in terms of uh, uh, my ability <laughs> <So>. <laughs> okay can you see my screen sir yeah uh, okay so this was when the patient came to me uh, okay. if you can read that yeah. and uh, so this was dr pradeep's case i didn't even put the complaints and all it was perry the point here is he came in the asymptomatic phase okay, okay. 
Now, in the asymptomatic phase, the ECOG is likely to be negative. We did it. I, I but, also noticed that you're on the top, you're written uh, free of cost. Sir, it was Dr. Pratik's patient. I'm, it's the same thing, no? it's just one team. Okay. He, he, he's a classmate, as in like classmate. Okay. And we don't touch doctors by default. We, that's our principle. Yes. Let's go for it. So, um, so anyway, so uh, ECOG G was negative because we did it in the asymptomatic phase. Uh, if we do it within three days of an attack, it works. Otherwise, I don't even bother doing it. VEMS was done because we wanted to make sure that, uh, so I assume that the vestibular bit Dr. Pratik would have done and VEMS, we are just testing to see if there's any uh, vestibular involvement, which could be occult in, or covert involvement uh, and, and not visible. So it was all fine. But the more important part is that I asked him to visit our website because we have a test your hearing at home on our website, which is grossly uh, inaccurate, which doesn't at all correspond to an audiogram that you do in clinic. However, it is a great tool for you to relatively check what was your hearing before and after. And this is something that he doesn't need to go anywhere. So I would, I would have encouraged him to do it every week. That's what I wrote. That do it every week. We need the evidence of fluctuation. And at the same time, I don't want to scare him about the other year because already this patient mm -hmm. is psychologically upset. Um, but mm -hmm. let him do this. Let him sort of send the audiometry to at least us or whoever. And we'll make sure that... Uh, that if something is happening with the other year, we, we are proactive in at least detecting it. Whether we can treat it or not, of course, it's something which is beyond us. But, but at least we'll be proactively doing something about it. Um, so, so testing the hearing at home can be done every week or every month. We don't really have to do it once in six months because we, we don't know if, if we'll be late about it. Also, when a patient has one bad year and is relying on the good year, then if the good year starts going bad, he doesn't have a gold standard to compare. The bad year he identified because, you know, he'll say, I don't hear as good in the right as I hear in the left. All good. But all through, he will continue listening better in the left ear as compared to right. So if the left is gradually going down, he would not even realize it very soon. He'll say, no, no, I hear better. This is my good year. That's what happens in, in uh, a, a profound hearing loss patient with moderate hearing loss in the other side. He comes and says, no, my other year is perfect. Because that he has no comparison to be made. So, so this is, we have to be more proactive. That's one. Uh, and my final thoughts are, sir, that, that uh, this, is a, this is a doctor that we are talking about. And this, again, puts into perspective how doctors are the most difficult patients. <laughs> it's a very difficult case. And, uh, uh, but I'm, I'm glad that, that he's getting the help that, that uh, with so many uh, excellent people like Dr. Keshri, uh, Dr. Pushkar, Dr. Bichrani, all on the case. So... So that's brilliant, and uh, all the best to uh, um, to Doctor uh, Doctor Pratik's friend. Uh, and that's all. Jay. And that that's a, and one more thing. You brought a very nice perspective here. That is home monitoring of the hearing. Uh, we, we, uh, and as you clearly said, it is not for diagnosing. Uh, it it doesn't match with the lab, but then it it is very good for comparing your own hearing from before and uh, later. And this is one thing that that, that should actually start becoming more uh, uh, more common, I think, for these people who need uh, monitoring of hearing. That's a wonderful thing that you have done, uh, Doctor Chitij. So that is that's really wonderful. Okay, is it only available for patients who have visited your clinic, or anybody can just tell visit so that? It, it's a free tool on the website. So go to the website. It's a free tool. We, they don't even and we don't even collect data for it. I mean, it's just there for public wonderful. good. So, so there's wonderful. all good. Wonderful. That's great. I think uh, it's everybody can note that uh, uh, the website ID Prime Hearing, right, sir? Prime Hearing Clinic. Dot com. Uh, can you just Prime Hearing dot com? Yeah. Primehearing.com. It's primehearing.com. And then go to test your hearing. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Now, round for final thoughts for, from everybody. Dr. Pushkar? Okay. I think Dr. Pushkar is audio, audio is not there. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you can hear me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah uh, I would like to add what Dr. Uh, Shitish told. He, uh, if the ECOG was done in the first three days when he had onset of symptoms, maybe there would have been some abnormality. Likewise, okay. I would say that MRI, when we were talking of uh, gadolinium enhanced MRI of the inner ear, mm -hmm. it will be worthwhile if it is done to confirm if and when he, if at all he has a future attack and first three mm -hmm. to four days of the attack before. Mm -hmm. So that time, maybe there is a chance of picking up uh, any component of hydrops 
if at all so it will okay. give more so you are you are extending the end, the the ecog g to even mri also yes yes okay. because uh, see uh, like we all know in meniere's disease uh, when there is an asymptomatic period person has a normal findings he is completely symptom free and most of the tests turn out to be normal because okay. whatever component of eye drops has been there that has come down okay so if at all there is a cochlear eye drops in terms of we are thinking that it may be missed mm -hmm. when we are doing if at all we are doing a gadolinium enhanced mri during the asymptomatic period okay so that, so is, that, that is and problem. other thing is uh, if the patient is benefiting from uh, fluorazine i think we should continue that uh, to treat this patient as a migraine patient and if he uh, okay. if he does not get a further attack that means we are on the right path because there is no way we can do a scan or any blood test to diagnose whether it's migraine or not so therapeutic trial is a good option great yeah yes sir thank you thank you for those thoughts dr bijlani uh, uh continuing with, with with what dr pushkar just said you see what is hypothesized about meniere's till now is hydrops occurs then the membrane bursts there is a mixing of the ions on both sides perilymph endolymph and that toxicity is what causes the symptoms so now where is the hydrops once the membrane has burst so we are at a loss to decide in fact whether if we do the mri during the symptomatic period we are going to find out something or we do it in the asymptomatic period your comments dr srinivas uh my see there are in fact what happened is the moment pratik told that uh, he is uh, presenting this i did uh, some reading also mm -hmm. and uh, there was a question that was raised like why does only the reisner's Re membrane uh, swell why doesn't the basilar membrane swell if the pressure increases so that kind of questions were raised okay if it was it should balloon both sides why only the top top side balloons up why the bottom side doesn't balloon okay what is the like that kind of things and uh, that potassium mixing and all that it's it's a, it's a very nice uh, okay but potassium being mixed and that leading to the peripheries give uh, uh, the nerves be, uh, becoming hyperpolarized and then because of that becoming numb these kind of explanations they are very um, in the sense they are very tempting and they are very satisfying but what is a tempting and a satisfying explanation is it the real explanation okay no, no, so no, what no. is the no, proof really. from the yeah so that 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 you know in fact uh, i keep questioning whether pratik knows uh, the question how many of our bppvs are actually bppvs how many of them are actually because of the debris and is there a small percentage of them which is not because of the debris okay we keep asking the, the, that kind of question so just because we have a good explanation which works an explanation that actually seems to work may not be the final explanation maybe there is something more beyond it okay so keep our eyes open and uh, that is it maybe once we start collecting this maybe mri we start collecting one few da few days now we have a lot of good thing is a lot of us have started doing mri for this patient some with intra tympanic some with intravenous i have started with intravenous uh, contrast so let us see what happens after an attack after some attack. maybe one year down the line when we are having similar discussion probably bijlani sir i think we should be able to answer this better right yes. so we are still one more year stage of stage of speculating on things yes and uh, hoping for the best when was the first time you presented a uh, paper on vestibular paroxysm that was in 2015 seven yeah. years before moscow and still we uh, moscow and still even today uh, we have unanswered questions in paroxysm right very true only thing is we should we should we should keep this march forward and uh, slowly one after the other one 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 thing starts becoming more uh, understood more understood and more understood and we are swimming in untested we are we are in, uh, swimming in untested waters yeah yeah Un uncharted uncharted sea. uncharted voyage yeah one after the other one lighthouse after other we, we we go on establish right. one lighthouse that will guide us through yeah that will that will keep guiding us okay but we are doing a journey that is worth it so okay it's, it's good thing these are god forsaken patients nobody takes care of them so we are there for them that's good okay fine so uh, 
ओके आई थिंक डॉक्टर क्षितिज हैज गिवन हिज फाइनल से डॉक्टर पुष्कर डॉक्टर बिजलानी डॉक्टर अमित सो प्रतीक कंक्लूडिंग रिमार्क्स फ्रॉम यू सर आई थिंक वी शुड कंटिन्यू विद द सेम ट्रीटमेंट एंड एज डॉक्टर क्षितिज से सेट की वी शुड ऑलवेज लाइक वन से वीक आई थिंक वी शुड डू ए बी टी ए like that absolutely uh, i think that that's a new thing and lot of uh, lot of us will start using his uh, website his website will start getting more visits from now on from these from all of us definitely i'll undergo my hearing test tomorrow <laughs> okay that's a, that's a new one and that's a new thing and that's a good contribution to for a lot of us okay so thank you so much sir and uh, so with that shall okay, thank, thank you all thanks everybody for joining thanks prateek for bringing this beautiful case okay uh, though it is only non vertigo then but then lot of perspectives related to vertigo also start coming up because of uh, this particular patient and maybe we'll have more better understanding definitely lot of things we learned from one another today newer points okay which will make us uh, rich maybe next time we have better answers for these patients okay so thank you all of, and th i thank all the panelists uh, for uh, joining dr pratik th thanks for the case dr pushkar dr bijlani dr kshitij uh, uh, dr amit all of you thank you thank you so much for joining in at a short notice okay we want to continue this vertigo grand rounds every friday so the last friday of every month is grand rounds please keep that in the calendar and this is the kind of discussion we'll keep wanting to answer more and more questions okay and thanks all of you for joining have a great friday evening thank you all thank you sir thank you sir thank you for great presentation thank you